What's up, guys? Will Witt here. Will and Amla live. Amla's not here today, so just joined by Taylor today, talking about a few different things. Just me. Just yeah. Taylor. No, Taylor's good, though. We're happy to have him. So we got a lot going on the plate today. Dave Ramsey's on the show. Got some other things about books with atheism, Christianity. It's going to be an interesting show. But first, I want to start off with Chris Rufo today, where he was talking about the AP, Washington Post, and PolitiFact all said it was false that the DOJ was investigating school board protests as domestic terrorism. Do you guys remember when the DOJ was saying that? It was written out. It was in words that they were actually saying this wasn't, wasn't some conspiracy theorist, conspiracy theory, but they actually came out and said this. And then all these different news organizations, all these people on the left said, no, we never said that. We never said that they were domestic terrorists or anything like that. But they did. And the receipts are there. You can go back and look months ago. Look, it's right here. Chris Rufo, he had the original receipts of them saying that if you are going to one of these school board meetings, the FBI is going and investigating parents for being domestic terrorists. This is unprecedented because what is this? This is them trying to take away your freedom to object to the things that they are doing by saying that you are some sort of terrorist. It's like years and years of us being called racist or anti-vaxxer or any of these different types of things where they come and they label us as something to try and silence you. They want to come and call you a domestic terrorist because you are doing the right thing. If you are watching any of these left-wing news sites, CNN, MSNBC, they're coming on and they're talking about conservatives and they're talking about people who love freedom and they're talking about them winning. They're talking about them going into school boards and local city councils and being precinct committeemen and redistricting and poll watchers and all of these different types of things that you can do as a concerned citizen. And they, the people on the left say, this is a threat to America. This is a threat to America. This is scary. This reminds me of Nazi Germany. This reminds me of Hungary because these people are coming in and having their First Amendment right to go and do these types of things, right? Or to be able to apply for one of these positions. Conservatives are taking back America. The, the freedom-loving people in this country are realizing that things are getting worse than ever and they're going in to these local communities and they're taking them over. Right. And these people want to come and say that's a bad thing. And you will also have weak conservatives come and tell you that that's a bad thing. You say, oh, you got to you know, you just got to be cool with these types of people. We can't be too strong as conservatives. I totally disagree with that. There is no better time in America now to be strong than ever before because things continue to get worse. And it gets worse because conservatives have given the left the upper hand and have given them an inch every single time. And they have taken that mile and they will continue to take miles unless People who are strong parents, strong community members, get involved in these local places. But the left doesn't want you to do that. The left wants you to stay quiet. They want you to be that good little conservative. They want you to be in your box, okay? You can talk about basic Republican conservative things. But as soon as you start actually making changes in your community that is against what the left wants you to do, then they get upset. Then they label you a terrorist. Then they label you a racist. They say that you are destroying democracy. All you are doing is using your democracy to be able to make changes. It's a beautiful thing. Don't let these people shame you when they call you a domestic terrorist or a racist or any of these things. Use that as ammunition. Use that as fuel to fuel you to go and do more because they are trying to shame you for it. If you look back in, in communism and, you know, in Mao with China and in Russia, other places around the world, what did they want to do? They wanted to get rid of the old and bring in the new. They told you that the things of old, the things of the past were actually destroying society. They said, oh, well, we need to get past all this. You know, all the cultural landmarks of uh, Confucianism and Buddhism and all these things in China, destroy those and put up these giant steel skyscrapers and all this kind of stuff, the new stuff, get rid of the religion, all of that, right? So you coming in and protesting and saying, I like the way things were in this country. I believe in the traditional values that this country was founded on. That is why they want to silence you. Because those are the old things that actually have been working for a long time and they want to usher in their new communist era in this country by destroying the things of the past. Don't let them destroy the things of the past. Don't let them destroy your heritage, the things that you grew up on, the things that you are proud of, the things that makes America the greatest country in the world. Not the, not the new things that the left wants to push into America that will make America uh, just like any other country and put it down the drain. You want to preserve the things that make America the best, right? But they want to cancel you for it. What is cancel culture? What is cancel culture in the in the grander scheme of things that these people want to do? Cancel culture is people who have never had new ideas in their lives coming and telling you that you are saying the wrong thing because they've never said anything novel or new or interesting. They're jealous. It's envious. Envious of, of people who have difference of, of opinion. 
That's what cancel culture is, right? And unpopular ideas are the best ideas in the world. You going into one of those school board meetings and talking about an unpopular idea, even if everyone hates you for it, and you're saying, listen, I don't want this trans ideology or, or this CRT or whatever else it might be being taught in my school, that is probably an unpopular idea in your community, especially if you live in a blue state. There's not going to be many people who agree with what you're saying, but unpopular ideas are the best ideas in the world. I love unpopular ideas. I like when I go on Twitter and Taylor and I and, and Amala, we send each other stories and things on on Twitter for the show and all sorts of other stuff. And it's like, I like the stories that are the ones that don't have many likes and retweets. I like the ones that are unpopular and then being able to talk about those kind of things to branch off and, and make people think about things a lot more, right? Unpopular ideas are the best because unpopular ideas are the ideas that made America. If it wasn't for unpopular ideas, you wouldn't have America. You had a handful of guys, the founding fathers, right? Who came and said, we have this, this radical idea to make a new country a new country get away from the British Empire and say we are going to do something different, something brave, and they founded the greatest country that is that has ever ever been created with America. No other country has a constitution like us, like a Declaration of Independence like us, inalienable rights from your creator. No other country has that. But think about it. That was just a handful of guys who came and said this. Everyone at the time was was hating on these guys. I mean, they had the entire country of, of Great Britain against them. Only 3%, you guys ever heard the term 3 percenters? Only 3% of the people actually in the colonies fought in the revolution against Great Britain. It's not like this was a very popular thing to do. If the founding fathers were alive today and were tweeting these things on Twitter, they'd, be, they'd probably be banned or get at least shadow banned by these new guys who are there. But because of unpopular ideas and because of their unwavering support for these ideas, America was able to flourish because people stayed brave and they stayed adamant about what they believed in. If you are one of these people and people are coming up to you and saying, well, you know, you just can't say that. No one else is saying that. No one else is going to school board meetings or local city councils or precincts and, and, and saying these things. You don't want to be the one to ruffle these people's feathers. No, you, you do want to be that one because it's only the people who have the unpopular ideas, the ideas that are not just the mainstream that the left is pushing that are going to bring this country back. You have to be willing to take that brave fight to these people and stand up because if you don't, then it's, it's, it's over. America will be over. If people are more scared of what people are going to think about them, then instead of actually getting something done, then this country is gone and the American spirit is gone. I, I wrote a piece yesterday about China. And how America should boycott the, the Beijing Olympics. And I ended the piece saying that the most important thing of why we would boycott the Beijing Olympics is because we would be showing China that the American spirit of liberty and freedom and standing up for what is right is alive and well by doing that. And that we will not accept China, the Chinese Communist Party, as our new overlords. And it's the same thing here in America, within the country, that we are seeing what the left is doing, we are seeing what they are calling us, and we are saying, we will not let you be our new overlords and destroy this country. Not now, and not ever. That's my opening for the show today. Good. Well, now we're going to Dave Ramsey. So, we got an interview with Dave Ramsey today. Uh, it was great. He talked about his new book, Baby Step Millionaires, which you guys are going to hear all about. And and uh, yeah, let's get into that. All right, everyone. We have the legendary Dave Ramsey on the show today. It's an honor to have you, sir. Well, I'm honored to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, we've had uh, some great PragerU presenters from the Ramsey Network, the Ramsey family. We had uh, Rachel Cruz. You know, her video has over 3 million views on PragerU. we got to do something with you, too. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad Rachel did well. Yeah, no, it, it's all been very successful. Now, you have a new book coming out, Baby Steps Millionaires. Tell us a little bit about the book. Well, I really hadn't done a major trade book in about eight years and didn't have an intention to do another one. But I kept running into a couple of things that... Well, they just correlated and told me I needed to do it at this time. One was I kept hearing all this drumbeat in the marketplace uh, from people that with a political agenda or some kind of socialist agenda or whatever it is, explaining to people that, you know, that the American dream is dead. The chances of getting ahead and building wealth and being financially successful in America is over. You can't do it now. The only way to have money is inherit money. And I knew that to be a lie. And I knew these people were out there just stealing people's hope are hope stealers. I don't care for hope stealers because uh, we're in the hope business. And so uh, 
Uh, and the other piece was I knew it was wrong because I kept running into after 30 years of teaching people to get out of debt so that they could be generous, so that they could build wealth. I kept running into these people who had followed our baby steps and become millionaires. And, and there's like tens of thousands of them because we've had millions of people go through our classes and millions of people on the radio, millions of books sold, all that kind of stuff. So there's easily tens of thousands of millionaires out there. So I knew we had the proof that these hope stealers were wrong. And so that's really what the book is. It's the all the evidence from 30 years of experience, from an airtight study of 10,000 millionaires, from uh, lots of wonderful stories of people who really did it, uh, to show that, yes, while America's got our troubles, while we got things we got to overcome, and ne- success is never easy, it is very doable today to become a millionaire. Yeah, I'd like to talk more about that. I mean, I know as someone who I work in the more political, cultural world, and I see what's happening with the economy and, you know, price of education is going up, price of housing is going up, healthcare, all these things are going up. And when you see all of that happening, do you still think that the American dream is alive for most people? Yes, it is. Um, Because here's the thing. One element of all of that inflation is the cost of wages the cost of employees, and it enters into the cost of goods sold and drives the prices up. We've got 1,100 folks working here at Ramsey, and what it takes to hire a developer, uh, a senior-level developer, is substantially different than what it was three years ago. And guess what? That cost, then, is built into the things that we sell, which drove those prices up. has to be. Because, but the developer's making money more money than he's ever made, she's ever made in their life. And so, uh, you know, the, the wages are correlating with it for the people that choose to enter fields that, that where they can do that. Now, certainly you can, you manage to fail in America. It's possible. But if you, if you will ride some of the waves of some of the wonderful things happening right now in our economy, uh, you can make more money than you've ever made in your life. And what is the the number one piece of advice that you tell people, say, hey, if you want to be a millionaire or you want to make it in America, what do you tell people as the first step? What is the first baby step? Well, the seven baby steps are what we've taught forever. That's not really new material for us, but the book is more about showing exactly how they work. Baby step one is $1,000 in the bank. Quickly do that. Two is get all your debt paid off except your house. We use the debt snowball to do that. You probably heard that list from smallest to largest. And because if you get rid of your non-mortgage payments in most households, that's fourteen hundred bucks a month, twelve hundred bucks a month, somewhere right in there. If you invest that in your four hundred one k, that alone eventually will make you a millionaire. I mean, that, that's fifteen thousand bucks a year, and that that will turn into some serious money if you invest that over time. So you get out of debt because that's your most powerful wealth building tool. Then you finish your emergency fund is baby step three. Baby step four is really where the millionaire stuff starts happening. You start putting fifteen percent of your income after you've done these other things. You've got some money, fifteen percent of your income into retirement, four hundred one ks, IRAs, Roth IRAs, good growth stock mutual funds. And then kids' college is baby step five, and six is pay off the house early. When we studied all of these millionaires, it was 10,000 of them in the largest study of millionaires ever done in North America, we discovered the typical millionaire in their first $1 to $5 million worth of wealth typically amounts to a really nice paid-for house, four, five, six dollars $600,000 paid-for house, some cases more, some cases less, but right in there, and somewhere around a $1 million in their 401ks and in their retirement mutual funds. And they did that over 12 to 17 years. So the biggest advice I've got is get in a system, get in a proven process, and don't fall prey to all the get rich quick that's going on out there, particularly right now. A whole new wave of get rich quick has come through. And just get the steady, 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 steady. And you have a very high probability of building wealth then. Yeah. And I really agree with you. I think that people have to be able to take control of their own lives, take control of their own finances to make something happen. One thing that that I've seen is, you know, baby boomers at about the age of 35, they own 21 percent of the nation's wealth. Millennials right now at about that same age only own three percent of the, the nation's wealth. Why do you see that that this is happening? Or do you think that there's a cultural problem when it comes to younger people in this country with money or What are you seeing as the biggest problems facing young people financially today? Well, I think that uh, the millennial numbers are weird because the millennial generation is, it's so bifurcated. I've got a whole bunch of millennials on our team and I love this generation. It's an incredible generation. And uh, 
But by bifurcated, I mean this. There is no middle ground with millennials. There's only two kinds, awesome and sucks. I mean, they're just, it's like they're useless <laughs> yeah. or they will chase the, you chase down the gates yeah. of hell with a water pistol. And so what you'll probably find if you dove, drilled down into that stat is that a certain portion of millennials have unbelievable wealth way ahead of the game and a so- certain portion are almost nothing. So it's not a cultural breakdown or a generational breakdown, or we've got a whole generation that forgot how to be smart. It's just this bifurcation in that particular generation, which I think makes them incredible. I I just, again, we love having them on the team because they're very, very passionate and and they do build wealth. I mean, I had a, I had a millennial yesterday, 32 years old, paid off their home and their net worth is a little over a million dollars. That's incredible. What what are some of the success stories that you've seen? Do you have any off the top of your head that you're like, this blew me away, something to give people who might be watching this and saying, well, you know, maybe it'll work for someone, but it won't work for me. Do you have any success stories that you can list off? After doing this for so long, we've met someone of every possible situation or demographic that has done it. And so racism is real. Sexism is real. But I meet people who overcome both of them all the time and, and become successful financially and in other areas of their life anyway. And so, you know, everybody's got some kind of deck that is stacked against them one way or another. And, and the one thing all of these people that I meet have in common, whether they're regardless of their race, their background, their religion, where they're coming from, is they have this, I have the ability to look past the stacked deck and go, I'm going to win anyway. I'm going to figure out a way. Jackie comes to mind. She's in the story. African-American lady, just precious. Oh, she is. She is a neat woman. And and she grew up in poverty. I mean, really bad situation uh, and vowed that, you know, she was never going to be hungry again and never be with only one pair of shoes again. And went to school, went deeply in debt to go get her degree, got married and started in a middle class lifestyle with a bunch of student loan debt and a bunch of other debt. And that in that marriage ended in divorce, and she finds herself as a single mom right back in subsidized housing, right back on welfare. And, and she's like, no, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. And she made her decision that day, I'm going to learn how to step by step by step get out of this mess. And we meet her in the book many years later, and now she's a millionaire, and, and now she's raised two kids, uh, gotten remarried, and, and has just a wonderful life. But, you know, she overcame being a single mom, lady, African-American. I mean, she had everything going against her. And with a background that didn't have anything to do with money and a background that n- no reason she should think she could win and went and did it anyway. And those are just wonderful people. They're so fun to meet. You talked to there about student debt. And luckily myself, I dropped out of school, so I don't have really any student debt. But I know people who I grew up with who have I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars of student debt. Are you seeing right now that it's worth it for people to get into that amount of debt to go to school? Or what do you say is like the alternative or the right path to take with that? Because we have we have a, a young audience who watches us who might be thinking, you know, it's just too expensive for me. We just launched a, uh, a major uh, full on documentary that is um, on Amazon Prime and several hundred thousand people have already viewed it called Borrowed Future about the student loan debacle in North America today. It's an epic failure. It is a serious, serious problem. And lots of people are really trapped. It's really sad, but they can get out. We can show them how, but man, you know, my recommendation would be to never go in. No, there's not a situation where I've ever recommended someone take out a student loan to go to school. And the reason is you can get an education without going to school with that school, the school you can't afford. And and the problem is we got people with $200,000 in student loan debt that, you know, their degree is left-handed puppetry. You know, this just doesn't work, you know? So uh, what we tell folks to do is if you're going to go to school and a four-year education is a fine thing, there's nothing wrong with that. Get a, obviously get a degree in something that's usable and that the marketplace will pay you for, that there's a rate of return on your investment of time and of money. But first thing is pick a school you can afford. And that may mean you go to two years of, of uh, junior college, you know, and a lot of states that's free. Get that out of the way and, and then go to an in-state school, transfer all those credits and work while you're in school. But college choice overpaying for the degree is the number one cause of the student loan mess. Going to schools that people can't afford, getting degrees that don't matter. And then people are stuck with a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, and it's a mess. 
So yeah, pick very, very carefully. I'm not one that says all higher education is bad. No, I believe in getting a degree. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's lots of trades you can do too that make a lot more than, than I mean, I make diesel mechanics making a whole lot more than somebody with a master's degree in social work. Right. No, talk, talk a little bit more about trade school. What do you think with that? Should people go into debt if they're getting trade school? No, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to send you this is Dave Ramsey. We're not right. sending you in debt for anything. Man. It's <laughs> not. No, no. But but I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking to young guys and gals that are welders. Uh, they're diesel mechanics. They're heat and air. Uh, they're, they're setting themselves up in the trades. And my friend Mike Rowe is really excited about this trend we're seeing. Dirty jobs guy. And he and I've had some great talks about this. It's just it's exciting to see the trades come back alive because they are legitimate. And the whole higher education movement looked down upon the trades as if they weren't a valid way to live your life. And they are. It's just a matter of what you're called to. But there's not certainly, but we're not going to say all four year degrees are not worth it. No, some of them are definitely worth it. Uh, particularly if you get a bunch of scholarships and you go for free, you work your way through, you pay reasonable tuitions and those kinds of things. Yeah, go get a good business degree, good marketing degree. There's nothing, you're going to learn some stuff doing that. When it comes to credit cards, I, I, I know you talk a lot about this and I have a lot of friends who will say, you know, I, I get credit cards and I even didn't even follow your advice. I have credit cards too. And now that I'm talking to you, I feel kind of bad about it, to be honest. <laughs> Forgive but, me, uh, Father, I, for uh, I've sinned. <laughs> yeah, I've sinned. I didn't follow the baby steps. But, no, you know, people will come and say, well, I have a credit card because then I get these points. I get these points. Or, you know, I need to have a credit card so that I can build up this credit so I can buy a house or buy a new car or, you know, whatever it is. What is your recommendation when it comes to how people should use them or if they shouldn't even use them at all? Well, there's a couple of different elements to your question there. It's a really good question. Um, element number one is the points that you get back. Uh, we studied 10,000 millionaires, the largest study of millionaires ever done. Airtight research, very detailed, very in-depth. And the number of millionaires that we talked to that said that they became millionaires because of using points on their credit cards was precisely zero. So it's absolutely bogus. It's just a rationalization and a justification. 78% of the airline miles that are collected on credit cards are never used. Eight out of 10. And yet people are spending their butt off and going, oh, but I got airline miles. Oh, but I got discover points. Here's the thing. If you get a 1% back on your card, that means you get $1,000 for every $100,000 you spent. Tell me how this formula turns into wealth. It doesn't. So that, that's just that, that whole idea. Is, it, that's just of someone going, I need a reason so I can do whatever the flip I want to do, which is I want to buy stuff I can't afford with money I don't have to impress people I don't even really like. So that, that's just silliness. The second one is I, the credit score issue. And the banking industry has taught all of America to worship at the altar of the great FICO. Oh, great FICO, we bring you offerings of interest. So you will raise our number so we can buy other things. Now, let's think about what a credit score is. There's only one way you get a credit score and maintain it, borrowing money. It's 100% having to do with borrowing money. All of the algorithm is built on that. It's not built on net worth. It's not built on your income. It's only built on your interaction with debt. So if I want a high credit score, I go borrow money. Why? So that I have a high credit score. Why? So that I can borrow money. Why? so that I can have a high credit score. Why? So that I can borrow money. There's nothing in this equation that causes you to build wealth. Nothing whatsoever. You're building a lot of wealth, however, for a bank. So millionaires pay cash for everything except possibly a house, and you can buy a house with manual underwriting if you want a mortgage with zero credit score, with a zero credit score. Uh, had a guy on the air three days ago that did that. He was in his 20s. And he had never borrowed money in his life. He was a financial peace baby. His parents went through our stuff years ago, never borrowed money, went to Churchill Mortgage, got a mortgage, manually underwriting, absolutely no credit score. Same interest rate as everybody else, put it on a 15-year fixed, no trouble at all. But you can't do a lot of things without a credit card. I haven't had a credit score in 30 years. So there's cer certain things I can't do without that. Uh, but you know what? I'll, I'll make the trade because I'm not giving the bank all my stinking money. Yeah, you brought up an interesting point there when you were just talking about, you know, people are buying things that they don't need to impress people they don't like. Talk a little bit about that, a little bit deeper on that, if you could, just about, you know, maybe the culture of America and the way that people spend their money on things. 
Well, I went broke in my 20s and lost everything. And in that unbelievably painful and scary, terrorizing experience, uh, I, I lost, one of the things I lost that was a huge benefit to me was I lost my need to impress other people. And uh, before that, I was really concerned about what other people thought about my car or my watch or my coat or whatever. I was really, I was really a pretty shallow, arrogant little twerp, really. And so, uh, but when I went broke, it, it ground that out of me. And I, cause a lot of the people that were supposed to be my friends, suddenly they didn't care about because we didn't have anything anymore. We're, we're gone. It was gone. And, you know, the Jaguar is gone. The house is gone. The trips to Hawaii are gone. And so, uh, you know, all of a sudden I looked like people didn't know what to do with that. And so when I, when I quit caring what people thought, then I only made purchases that were good for me, my family, and our future. And when you narrow your purchases down to that, it changes your purchases. It changes what you're doing. And it doesn't mean you don't buy some nice things. I've got a really nice car, a couple of them right now, uh, but I didn't buy any of those for what someone else thought. I bought them because I liked the car and it was for me and it was for my wife, you know, and, and so we're, we're going to enjoy that. But my need to impress somebody at a stoplight that I'll never meet is absolutely zero. And, and Americans spend $756 a month to impress somebody at a stoplight that they will never meet. I mean, we're crazy out here. We're just nuts. The thing on our coat, the thing on our whatever. Oh, my goodness gracious. The prestige spending is is bizarre. You know, what we spend, what some people spend for a purse or the color, the right color on the bottom of their high heel shoes. Wow. Uh, it, it's 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 nuts. But it's fun. It's fun to watch. But the people that we meet that build wealth. One of the things that happens to them or that they just make a decision on is they want to love their life, not theirs, as Rachel Cruz says in her book. I want to wrap it up here after what you just said. It, it's kind of a bigger question, but when you look at the way that people spend money and the way that America is, it seems in some ways America has a little bit of a, a sickness, a cultural problem. Uh, people can definitely become the millionaires like you were saying. I 100% agree with you. But if you had to look at the things happening with America financially, maybe when it comes, I know you like to say, don't spend like Congress. What would you kind of give as a, an antidote to the future of America for people to hear on this show today? Well, it, it was true in my life, and it's been true with a whole bunch of people we've led away from overspending, away from debt, into wise spending and building some wealth and into a situation where they can be outrageously generous. That is a mathematical uh, journey for sure, but it is not merely a mathematical journey. And you won't take the mathematical journey unless you first and simultaneously take the spiritual journey with it. And, and so you've got to really decide what's real, what's important, where are we really going? And, and so part of what is driving this uh, ridiculous level of consumption is just our uh, emotional and spiritual shallowness. <laughs> and so the, if we would all grow up just a little bit, including Dave, you know, we would all be running this whole thing a whole lot better. And, and it really is, it really is a lack of maturity. Adults devise a plan and follow it. Children do what feels good. That's exactly right, man. Well, thank you. And look, we got, a uh, we got Dave Ramsey kids here too. All right. Which, uh, I don't have any kids. Unfortunately, someday soon, hopefully. But uh, a lot of our staff here, they have kids and they all use these books and awesome. they're really excited about it. We have a, we have a program with PragerU for kids as well yeah. um, that I think would be awesome to get, get them involved with the Ramsey Kids stuff too. Absolutely. So how, how can people find out about your book, find out more about what you're doing and just keeping updates on everything? I appreciate that. RamseySolutions.com's got everything. You can find out about the, all the shows and the podcasts and everything else we're doing here. Certainly any of the books or classes that are taught and all that kind of stuff. And we'll, we'll help you out any way we can. Fantastic. Well, Dave, it really means a lot that you came on today to discuss all this. I know it's a different type of audience, and I think they're really going to appreciate the things you had to say today, man. So I hope we can work together again soon. Absolutely, brother. Thank you for having me. I was honored to be with you. Thanks, Dave. Wow. Well, Will, that interview is better than we deserve. Oh, that interview was better than spending like Congress. It was really good. It was better than <laughs> fried biscuits on a Tuesday in January. Is that what Dave Ramsey talks about? No, I just made that up. No? That's kind of Southern racist. Well, my wife's from Georgia. Okay, so that's fine. Yeah. Bulldogs. Go dogs. Yeah. National I champions. Know. I know. It's a big deal. Yeah, it's a huge deal.
Well, not out here, not in LA. Uh huh. But everywhere else. No, I know. Well, listen, just like the Bulldogs destroyed their comp- competition, we have a, a friend here on the show who also has a book with the word destroys in the title. Atheism destroys. Quite the title. I understand. It's a little abrasive, but we're going to get into this interview. I, got, I want you guys to hear what he has to say. This is Barack Lurie, who also uh, helped on our lawsuit against YouTube. Prager, you, if you didn't know, we're suing YouTube for restricting our videos on their platform. And so he was a big part of that. Let's get into that. All right, guys, welcome. We have a very special guest today, a dear friend of mine, the latest author of Atheism Destroys, someone who has been with PragerU for years now, right? I yeah, mean, about 10, 11 years now. Yeah, so Barack Lurie, who is a former board member and actually oversaw and still is overseeing our case against YouTube. And so we were talking before, we actually have a lot of people who are new fans to PragerU who didn't even know that we were suing YouTube. I gave a speech yesterday and people were like, why are you suing YouTube? They had <laughs> yeah. no idea. Yes. So before we get into some of the other stuff, talk a little bit about the case and you know why we did that, why PragerU decided to sue YouTube and where it's gone. Yeah, it's a fascinating case. It's been uh, many years in the, in the making already and that's kind of a painful part of the story, I suppose, but also not surprising either. Look, uh, we were one of the very first victims of this censorship process where they were really going hard at PragerU. Why? Because PragerU was so successful. It reached so many people. So they were a natural target from an enemy's point of view to silence. And silence they did. They, As you know, they cut out all sorts of uh, videos and everything else. PragerU has been very adept about maneuvering around that, which I'm so proud about. Uh, but I remember first getting the call about uh, what, what shall we do? What should we do? I mean, this is an interesting thing. And of course, we knew that we had to get some big time lawyers to help us, and we got a great firm to help us. Uh, and we're now, you know, having sued both in district court and in state court. Uh, regardless, it's a two-tiered system for those who don't know the law very much. But nevertheless, um, it's going to be—it's uh, all keyed up now to go to the Supreme Court uh, in both the the matters. So it, it ultimately will be resolved by the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. And look, the issue is without, because I, I always want to make the law interesting, but it is super interesting what's mm-hmm. going on. So what's happening? They, they are censoring all these videos and they're claiming to do so uh, in the names of some sort of decency. Okay. We're able to show, of course, that they are otherwise allowing all sorts of other videos that are far more, way beyond the pale. Uh, one of the funniest ones that they, one of the most funny events that they did in terms of censoring one of the videos was the one where Dennis Prager talked about the Ten Commandments and specifically about the one, thou shall not murder. And they thought the word murder, well, that was just, you know, that's just too much. So that was their reason for censoring that. So what's the and so issue? One thing, just to note there, yeah. instead of, because they were restricting our videos, right. not censoring. So Correct. what is the difference between restricting and censoring when it came to the videos on YouTube? Right. Uh, restricting basically means for any of those computers that have any sort of controls or restrictive controls, usually parental controls, mm-hmm. right? Right. Uh, nothing or at to a do school violence, or a library to, or anything yeah, like that. Yeah. Anything like that. Um, then they would not have that video available to watch. Right. Which is a huge mass of people out there. So yes, you're right. It's not censoring. Uh, it's not completely deplatforming that video, but it is basically saying uh, only so many people will be able to watch this video. Right. No, it's still censorship. It's just not to the degree where they are going and taking videos down or something like that. But it's like, right. you know, imagine, I mean, imagine me being in high school at some point and saying, I want to do a video about the Korea or a paper right. about the Korean War and I want to find sources on it. And I search on YouTube for something about it. And all I get is left wing sources because the the views of PragerU, they're being restricted on That's the exactly platform. Right. That's right? exactly right. So why are they treated, why is PragerU treated differently than other, than other organizations when it comes to that? Right. Well, they, they claim to have an al- algorithm about this, but in fact, we now know and feel very comfortable that, in fact, there are human beings that are deciding to restrict this. It's obviously because of the content. They want uh, a p- certain political agenda to be advanced, and uh, PragerU doesn't conform to that political agenda. So here we are. And it's, it's bad stuff, and we, are, we have a couple legal theories as to why this should be reversed and why they should be held to account. But the primary one is the um, Section 230 of the code, which says that you can't be uh, at once a public forum and at the same time being a publisher. You can't have that. You can't have it both ways, right? So very briefly, a publisher is, think of the New York Times, for example, or the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you may write an editorial for them, and they may say, no, thank you. Uh, are you being censored? No. They are a publisher. They're allowed to edit and decide what content is going to go out there. 
Um, and because of that, because of that discretion, there's also the possibility that they can be sued for defamation or other legal action. So they are responsible for the content, all the more so why they can exercise discretion. A public forum, by contrast, think about like Craigslist or whatever, um, they are allowed to, you can put whatever you want on it. But in exchange, the, um, the owner of the platform, let's say Twitter or Facebook or YouTube, uh, can't exercise discretion as to what it platforms and doesn't platform. Censors doesn't such, uh, censor or restrict or not restrict. YouTube, Google, uh, which owns YouTube, is basically trying to have it both ways. They want to be able to say, we're a platform, we get to do whatever we want, uh, and we can't be sued either. So you can't have it both ways. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, where it's all going to fall well, uh, eventually. So It's crazy because what people don't realize is that if Facebook were to really be a publisher and this free speech tool all at the same time, that would mean that, you know, I call Taylor I, I, on Facebook, I say he's ugly and a liar. And I could then, truth is a defense. I, you know, I mean, it's true. <laughs> it's true. But, you know, but Facebook would right. then be held responsible if they are a publisher, right, for the defamation that would occur on their platform. That is correct. So they want to be essentially both at the same time. I mean, why is, why is this not getting taken care of? I know that that social media companies get special privileges when it comes to from Congress and things like that. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, social media is, uh, does have some sort of special treatment, but only because they're so big and because they have some lobbying efforts and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, what's interesting is that Google actually had its representative in Congress, no less. So that's a public forum, right? That's the ultimate in uh, congressional hearings and uh, what we call judicially noticeable material. And the head of, um, I forget which division, nevertheless, uh, they asked her, is Google a public forum? And she responded, yes, we are a public forum. Okay. And a story then. Mm -hmm. We were very excited about that. And we presented that in our papers. Uh, the judge um, in the district, uh, district case uh, said, well, that was just uh, fluff. That was just uh, banter. It didn't really mean anything. It's very frustrating as a lawyer to hear this because uh, they prevailed on what's called a motion to dismiss. And you can't, you, you can't prevail on a motion to dismiss if there are issues of fact like that. Right. So this judge decided there was no issue of fact. That's a big problem for, for her, and we think it's going to get reversed ultimately. Right. Why do you think that? Because it's an issue of fact. Whether uh -huh. or not something is a public forum is clearly mm -hmm. an issue of fact. It's not. A do you think a lot of people still deal with facts now? I mean, that's that's the part of them that that right. I find difficult. Is like you have these things happening, and right. still for years. I mean, what what was it? Twenty eighteen when we were thinking about this lawsuit. Yeah. Now it's twenty twenty one, and these big tech platforms are getting even worse. I mean, they censored Twitter, censored the president of the United States, deleted his account. Marjorie Taylor Greene just recently, right. among a lot of other people who are getting. Matt Walsh just got you know suspended. He's back on, but you know these types of people they're getting suspended or taken off all the time. It's a question of enforcement, right? It's if, if somebody feels like they can get away with it, I mean, now, now we see that you can go ahead and commit crimes and steal up to $950, right? If they're not being prosecuted, well, then you'll get more of that behavior, won't right. you? And so it's the same sort of thing here. Um, if they see that nothing is happening to YouTube despite being sued and so forth and other companies that even have less money, uh, to pursue this, then what are they going to do? They're, they're going to continue to go ahead and censor and restrict and, and claim that, you know, look, YouTube is doing it, Twitter's doing it, well, I can do it too. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a question of enforcement really at the end of the day. Yeah. When the Supreme Court, and I say when, because I think it's going to happen, when the Supreme Court finally comes down and, and renders the right decision by saying, you can't have it both ways, and that was an issue of fact lady, meaning the district court judge, uh, then it'll be a, a very big sea change but it has to happen. This right. is not a First Amendment issue in the same way that they would like to claim it. It's a, it's a public forum issue uh, and a um, public forum issue and uh, what, what's the other one I was just saying? Platform, platform or publishing, yeah. publishing, so, platform, publishing platform. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you can't have it both ways. No. And it's something has to come down because we now know that these social media websites are the de facto mm -hmm. public forum for everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, the old days of saying, well, just create your own newspaper then. <laughs> you know, like... Well, it doesn't quite work that way. We, we know right. that it's a fact. Right. And it's no longer the exception for a private entity to do this. Um, it's the rule. Mm -hmm. So if everyone's doing it and they're actually choosing winners and losers as to what they can say, we've got a big problem on the, in the First Amendment horizon. Right. I mean, they had the, I think they did a guy with a study and he was like trying to find out how many websites he could click without running into Google ads in a certain amount of time. It took yes. him like, he tried so hard. It took, the, like the shortest amount of time he got was like two minutes. 
you know, wow. going, going through and trying to find a site that didn't have anything to do with Google. Wow. Like they dominate the market or, you know, like Microsoft spent billions of dollars creating Bing and they're on the cutting edge of technology. And I'm sure some of you guys watching use Bing, but <laughs> it's very few. OK, it's very few. Most people use Google. Google dominates the market. You know, so my advice to people who are watching, get off Google. I, I recommend DuckDuckGo. I, I think use, that, I use DuckDuckGo. Duck, Duck, yeah. yeah, it's very good. It's great. You know, I, I did a lot of research for my book when I was writing it, and we'll get to your book in just a second. But for my book, you know, I would search something on Google. I'd be like, crime statistics of police shootings, black versus white, you know, something like that. And you would have to go through so many things on Google to find it. And then you search it on DuckDuckGo, the exact study that I knew I was looking for, and it's right there. There it is, yeah. I know. You know? You're so right. It's so frustrating and, and demoralizing, isn't it? Yeah. It, it feels... Because we, because we know, we know the truth. We know that Google is censoring information, and we know yeah. that they're left leaning and all of these kinds of things. But most people, they search on Google and they have no idea. They think that this is just the information you get. They think it's just a fair search that you're right. getting, right? right? Yep, it's that's exactly problem. right. And that's that's the misrepresentation that's going on. We need to fight it. All of us need to fight it. And look, thank God for PragerU because um, PragerU fortunately has the wherewithal and the savvy to know how to go beyond YouTube when necessary. It doesn't. It learned to not rely on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And so thank God for that. That was very good. Now we're, we're no longer in a position where we have to, you know, beg, borrow, and steal to stay on, on YouTube. Right. Uh, and I say we, I mean PragerU. Mm -hmm. um, we have our own platform. We got the PragerU platform. We've yeah. got other sorts of uh, directions where we can channel ourselves and get the word out. So thank God we have, well, how many is it? Billions of views now. Yeah, five over five billion views, and you know a lot. A lot of our our views come from our website now, which is different than years past. That yeah. we've been able to grow our website audience so that we don't have to be so dependent. So, guys, if you want to watch our videos as well without supporting any of these platforms, you can always go to PragerU.com because all of our videos are on there, and also a lot more, a lot more stuff that isn't on YouTube or on Instagram or Facebook. Like we post everything on there. So, you want to go see old videos of me interviewing people from five years ago? They're there. You can go find them. Yeah. So let's talk about your book a little bit, man. All right. I, I got to be honest. Atheism Destroys. That's a tough title. <laughs> it is. Have you found that this title has potentially thrown some people off where they're like, oh, that's a little bit too, uh, you know, abrasive for people? Yeah, it, it's a very abrasive for yeah. a lot of people. It's the second of my uh, Atheism Kills series. Mm -hmm. So Atheism Kills was the first one. It did very well. It's a mm -hmm. great bestseller. And uh, Atheism Destroys now is the second of the three-part volume. And uh, yeah, that's one of the things I, I'd love to talk about because the response to it yeah. is fascinating to me. Uh, it, it's vicious. Uh, Dennis says, Dennis Prager says this all the time, that the time he gets the most attacks, attacked is when he talks anything about God and how important God is. Well, yeah, I've, I found that out pretty well too. But uh, aside from them just calling me a moron and saying that uh, religion has caused more deaths, what are you talking about? Hitler was a Catholic. Uh, all the crazy things you can possibly think about. Uh, they say it, and but it's vicious. A lot mm -hmm. of this stuff is out there, and it's clear that they have not read the book. They have not seen any of my YouTube videos myself. My, I have my own channel. Um, they clearly have not seen it. Now, I, and then I wonder to myself, well, why the viciousness, right? Because if you're an atheist, your mantra is, well, I just don't believe in God. What's the big deal? I just don't subscribe to your crazy unicorn sky god. I know this because I was an atheist once myself, so Same. I know this. Yeah. So, uh, and then I think to myself, well, why are they so vicious? If, if, if they just don't believe in God and just want to be left alone, okay, then why are, why are they even bothering to respond to my crazy book, Atheism mm -hmm. Destroys? Why isn't it just like, you know, if I were to do a, a post saying, I think Radiohead is better than Pink Floyd, you know, which by the way, I think they are. But nevertheless, all right. You know, well, we'll have a oh my gosh, we're gonna have a disagreement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you get the idea. I get it. Um, then you know, you might get some people saying, "Well, I don't know. What have you thought about this album versus that album?" You know, but people wouldn't really respond to that. But for people who supposedly think that God is no big deal and they just don't believe in God, wow, they sure are animated, and they get more vicious than anything you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's I, what I've noticed about that. I found when I was becoming a Christian. Yeah. And I was still an atheist and I was figuring out my faith and talking to people. Yeah. I mean, the Christian people who I met were some of the nicest people ever. You know, you, you kind of, when you're an atheist, you're scared. They're going to be like, oh, I hate you. They're going to judge you. Right. And it was like, I went to church and they're pulling me on both limbs saying, Damn come straight. sit next to me in my yes. pew. You know, like they, they're very welcoming. <laughs> yeah. They, they want to talk to you. And, and not just because they want to convert you, although there might be an aspect of that. That's right. fine. But they, they want to help you. 
I think that's what they really are, are after. Yeah. You and I probably experienced the same thing. I was in college and um, I, I was always bantering with these uh, born again guys who were in the dorm down the hallway and they were nice. They were just really nice. It was easy to talk to them, always respectful. And it was hard for me to make fun of them. Mm-hmm. At the very least, I knew that. And then one day I discovered that I probably believed in God. <laughs> Free will, consciousness, self-awareness, uh-huh. yep. whole, whole bunch of reasons. And I came to them. And, well, I got to tell you, as I, I, I felt that I should tell these guys first. Because they've been so, they would be appreciative. Cordial to you, yeah, yeah. And as I walked there, I felt my legs turning to lead. To lead. I just could not walk. And I thought, what? why is this so difficult for me? I believe in God. Now I believe in God. Why am I having such a tough time acknowledging that? And I figure it out. It's not like I decided that, uh, you know, the Mets are better than the Dodgers or whatever. Right? It's, it's not like that. This was a heavy, big change in my life. Maybe you felt the same way, I, but suddenly it was about accountability. Mm-hmm. I knew that this meant the shift from thinking that anything was acceptable to now I have to be responsible for myself. I have a role in civilization. I have a duty to get married one day. I have a duty to have kids one day. I have a duty to be part of America and to be part of civilization, to make it grow. Right. That's a, that was a very big moment in my life. And I saw that. And having been an atheist, maybe, maybe you felt the same mm-hmm. way, I saw how destructive the mindset was. Yeah. Very, very destructive. The old atheists were, they, they were honest about how destructive atheism was. Mm-hmm. And it does destroy all the pillars of civilization that we value, mm-hmm. whether that's uh, family, relationships, uh, free speech. Without, these, without God, there, is, there are no values like those that we treasure. Mm-hmm. Um, courage, even courage, it doesn't, doesn't uh, keep up. So right. you have to have these things. Uh, you have to have God in order to enjoy those things, the pillars of civilization, yep. and it will destroy them. I 100% agree. Yeah. I 100% agree. I, I remember when I first did communion mm-hmm. for the first time. Yeah. I waited until after I got baptized to do it. That's awesome. Man. And man, I felt the chills, man. Yeah. It was all over my body. It was like something totally, I didn't expect that was going to happen. I was just like, oh, I'm just, yeah. you know, kind of running through the, you almost feel like, oh, I'm running through the the, the process now that I've mm-hmm. done it. And now I'm kind of just doing it. Yeah. It was like, it's like, whoa, man. I think it's crazy. And, I, and I'm a Jew I, and I, I love my Christian brothers. I, I mm-hmm. really call them my brothers. We are brothers in the fight for civilization. We've all contributed something dramatic. We should all be proud of that. I think what you're talking about and the way I felt too, and I enjoyed you know, loving God, accepting God in my life, it's the sense that now I'm, I'm keyed in to civilization. I'm part of it all. Right. That there's something very um, liberating about it and also at the same time liber- responsible about it. You feel a great about it. You feel a great joy because you're part of something far greater than yourself. Right. And I, it's a, it was a nice moment. But uh, without, uh, and I realize now that the way I was thinking, I was heading for a very dangerous path. Right. Where you, you know, anything goes, you know, and then you could steal so long as you get away with it. Mm-hmm. You can murder so long as you get away with it. Mm-hmm. And there are many movies to this effect. Right. No, if there is, if there is no God, then, then stealing and, and murder being wrong is just up to yeah. subjective opinion. Uh, so it always is. But that, that is the, uh, the challenge of it. And look, I mean, even free speech, for example, that's one of my major chapters in this book. People wonder how it is that God and free speech are connected, right? They, they are dramatically connected. In America, when you think of free speech, uh, you think of something sacrosanct. Even the atheist will say, there's something very special about free speech. And then you ask him, why? Why would you care about free speech? Doesn't it matter more what the government wants out of us? As we say, facts are always changing, right, according to the left. And, and it is. Uh, but for them, they don't, they don't get it. They, for us, the reason why we, see, we seek out free speech is because we seek out truth. Truth is, is only valuable if you believe in God. Justice is only valuable if you believe in God. Right. And honor, all those things that we treasure, only valuable if you believe in God. Right. The well, that's why they're inalienable rights given to you by your creator. Bingo. Right? Bingo. You know, and, the and government you know, can't take them away. We are the only country. Oh, yeah. And the only democracy, for mm-hmm. that matter, that enshrines free speech as derived from God. Right. All exactly. the other countries, democracies, they, they, they enjoy free speech too, but it's not the same. 
It's not the same. Yeah. No. It's like uh, driving for them. Sure, you can drive wherever you want, whenever you want, but for all these rules. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> it's a lot it's different. A lot. Yeah. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate you coming on, talking about all this. How can people pick themselves up a copy, see if it's as, as abrasive as, as people <laughs> might say it is, as terrible as they might say it is? How, how do they get a copy, man? It's, uh, it's available at Amazon. That's really your best source, Barnes yeah. Noble, so .com, um, on hardcover, softcover, and uh, Kindle. Eventually, it'll be on Audible as well. You but, reading it uh, yourself? Yes, I am. Nice. I, yeah. Yeah, you got to read it. I read mine myself. Yeah, you got to do that. You got to do that. It's awesome. It's, it's the best way to do it. Because, oh, for uh, sure. You can only get the rhythm of it and the tone that you want out of it and such like that. But you, you'll like this book. It's a very, um, it's a little cheeky from time to time, but it's a lot of fun, tells a lot of stories. And it's, uh, people are now responding saying it is um, irrefutable that they have to do this. And, and even a lot of atheists are saying, yeah, I'm an atheist, but thank God nobody else is. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's what I used to say yeah, at least. That's funny. So. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate it a lot. Everyone, check out the book, Atheism Destroys. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you share the show with your friends. Comment your thoughts down below. And remember, you don't have to watch us all the time. You can also listen to us on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts. So go on there, download the podcast, and rate it five stars on Apple Podcasts. Follow me, Amla, on social media. And we are going to see you guys in the next episode.